Last weekend at our supporters event in Asheville, North Carolina, I gave a talk where I proposed that mainstream economics is a broken discipline, both as an academic field of study and as a profession. So here to discuss that all-important question, is economics broken, is our own Dr. Joe Salerno, our academic VP here at the Mises Institute and a professor of economics at Pace University in New York and Auburn University here in Auburn. So stay tuned for a fascinating talk about whether economics is truly broken with Dr. Joe Salerno. Well, Dr. Joe Salerno, welcome back to the show. You know, last time you were on, believe it or not, was January of this year. And we didn't yet know at that time that Trump would be the Republican nominee. So we were talking at that time about whether and how the various candidates might talk about money. And so fast forward uh, 10 months, and we have heard a little bit from Mr. Trump about money. Talk about talk a little bit about Trump. Here we've got a real estate developer. There's, if there's anybody who could make the case that some people are unjustly enriched by artificially low interest rates at the expense of others, it would be Trump. Um, what do, what's your take on what he's said or hasn't said about the Fed so far? Well, he hasn't said that much, but 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 so far it's been good. He's been suspicious of the Fed. He came out and um, criticized Yellen's statement and the Fed's decision not to raise rates yesterday. Uh, in the past, he said that it would be great if we could go back to a gold standard, though he um, did not make a commitment in, in any way. Uh, he, he definitely does not seem to be tied into the financial elites who are, are always plumping for the Fed to keep interest rates low, and they're always defending the Fed. Well, I read recently that Yellen fears a Trump presidency in the sense that he, at least from her perception, would rock the boat. And, and I think we have to view that as a good thing, um, if that's true. Yeah, I agree. In fact, you know, some of his statements have been contradictory, but overall, he's been uh, talking against these super low interest rates and maintaining them into the future. So I think that is really making her nervous. Because if if you think about it, when they made the announcement um, about keeping rates steady, the the, stock market jumped, uh, long-term bond yields um, fell. And so uh, you can tell there's a bubble. The the financial sector is really unstable. And um, so even a small rise in rates that indicates continuing rates rising into the future may very well collapse the system, or at least certainly the bubbles in the system, including student loans. But don't you think we've entered into such a bizarro period that even a lot of mainstream economists and mainstream financial journalists are starting to say it's a bit bizarre that we're sitting here waiting on bated breath for this latest pronouncement, whether the Fed's going to raise interest rates a quarter point? Should that really rock our world so much? No, it, no, it shouldn't. In, in, in a sound economy, we have a sound money. That wouldn't happen. Our economy has become tremendously over-financialized, the real economy. The real economy has been forgotten in all this. Uh, and, and, and the reason is, of course, the, the monetary fine-tuning that has gone on since the 90s, these bubbles, first the, the, the tech bubble and, and then later on the housing bubble. And now we see a bubble in a number of areas. These unconventional monetary policies have created a sort of financial monster. And now that monster uh, has to be fed by super low interest rates. If it's not, it's just going to dissipate. It's, 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 it's going to die. And they're, they're all afraid of it. I mean, you know, the, the financial economists, the people on Wall Street and so on. Well, Hillary, for her part, certainly seems to support the monster. She's been mostly silent on debt and the Fed, except to issue a little warning the other day to Trump that he shouldn't criticize it. Do you, is your sense that she is completely comfortable with the status quo, the sort of technocratic uh, Janin, Janet Yellen management of our economy? Oh, I think that's exactly what she wants. She's uh, very, very comfortable with technocratic management. Uh, you know, she doesn't want the people to say anything. She wants him to believe, well, you know, we're taking care of everything. We're the experts. The less you know about what we're doing, the better off you are. So she's very anti-transparency, where at least one of Trump's themes is more transparency. And do you believe him? I mean, do you think Trump would would uh, appoint a, a decent secretary of the Treasury, for example? You know, I, I don't know. I, I don't know how much of what Trump says we can believe. Um, what I what I think is that he's not a political insider, and he may make some good appointments. Uh, it seems like he's. So the economists that support Trump tend to be sort of supply siders who aren't, you know, you know they, they talk a good game about gold, but they don't want to go back to a true gold standard. But but I think he would 
he would listen. He would be open-minded uh, in these areas because he really knows that he does not know everything about that area, right? So he might might think he, he knows everything about t- uh, how to stop terrorists, but he hasn't. Hmm. He's been pretty open-minded on economy on, on the economy. I think with Hillary, we know what we'd get, right? In terms of Secretary Ugh. of the Treasury, we'd get someone um, like Larry Summers, presumably. Larry Summers or somebody from Goldman Sachs. I mean, yeah, those are the people that we would get. It would just be more of the same. And, um, you know, eventually I think we are going to have an, uh, an inflation in consumer prices. Of course, we have inflation in assets. And what, what I fear is that if it does break out, that they're going to turn to wage and price controls. I mean, this is my big fear. I, I've thought about this since the, the early 2000s. I've mentioned this to people. Uh, and since consumer prices didn't explode upward, you know, we never got it. But that's in the back of my mind. And she would love to be involved in, you know, really planning the details of the economy. And that's scary. Well, today, Bill Bonner had an article uh, on the LouRockwell.com website talking about QE and whether additional rounds of QE will be necessary to keep this whole thing going. And he makes the interesting point that QE really represents a form of theft. In other words, it's a wealth tra- a form of wealth transfer from savers to speculators. And I'm wondering if you could elaborate on that. I don't think people, I don't think ordinary people really see QE as stealing from them. You know, look, all of these unconventional monetary policies, including QE and the negative interest rates now and so on, are um, what we would look at as a giant wealth transfer scheme that's not transparent. So what's happening is that, you know, the banks are getting money at very, very low rates and, and they're able to lend out at rates that are a little bit higher. The savers, the people who are putting their money into savings accounts at, you know, 0.01 percent and, and so on, are the ones that are getting hurt by this. Their pensions are being hurt. The incomes that they've been depending on uh, for when they retire, you know, they're not growing. So in that sense, yes, it's, it's financial repression. It's pushing down interest rates to benefit the financial sector and the people that obtain funds from that financial sector. The people that invest the funds in the financial sector, the small savers and so on. Because remember, governments and corporations are the biggest borrowers in the country, right? Uh, so the small savers are the ones that are, that are getting hurt. Uh, middle income people, lower income people. Well, I've noticed there's been a shift lately. If you recall, ever since the crash of 2008, when the Fed started rapidly adding to its balance sheet via QE, uh, the president of the St. Louis Fed and other Fed officials have told us many, many times that this is an extraordinary period and that someday the Fed's balance sheet would, would return to something like normal, something like pre-crisis, pre-08 levels. And now Ben Bernanke uh, coming out of the Fed's meeting in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, is saying, hey, maybe it's time to rethink that. So this seems like a huge but subtle shift in, in what Fed and, and former Fed people are saying. They're now saying that maybe the Fed's balance sheet is a permanent, uh, is a permanent thing and that extraordinary pol- monetary policy is the new normal. Yeah, absolutely. That's what they're saying. And they're, they're now coming up with sort of um, ex post facto justifications of all this. They're saying things like, well, you know, interest rates are going to remain low into the future. The natural rate, which, which is what they're aiming at, uh, the natural rate is going to remain low in the future because, for example, we're going to get all this savings from the wealthier emerging economies. So our economy is going to be glutted with savings. That's going to push interest rates down. Uh, we, we, we have aging populations and aging populations with shrinking um, workforces means a slower economic growth. And with slow economic growth, you don't want to raise the interest rate too much. You know, you got to be careful because that could collapse the economy and, you know, we can go back to no growth. There's low productivity now. Worker, they cannot explain. And let me take a step back, actually. The Fed about four or five years ago said that long term growth will return to 2.5 percent per year. Then just this past June, they lowered that number to 2 percent. Now, at this latest meeting, their expectations are 1.8 percent long term growth going into the future. And the reason is there's a productivity slowdown, labor productivity, the amount that workers produce per year has gone down and they don't know why. They've all admitted this. Well, we Austrians know why. We know why there's been tremendous overconsumption that is due to low interest rates that drove people's housing prices up and and their 401ks up, which, which caused them then to reduce their savings during the 2000s. And the other reason is what, what Austrians call malinvestment. 
So a tremendous amount of capital was invested in the wrong things and housing and, and other things um, and in uh, uh, fiber optics in the 90s. As a result of the tech bubble in the 90s, it destroyed a tremendous amount of capital and then the, uh, the housing bubble in the, in the early 2000s. And then what we have now. So capital is being destroyed and it's also being unwittingly consumed by people who should be saving it for the future. And with less capital, you have less machinery and investment in factories and lower labor productivity. That's why our real wages have not really been rising. But why is this such a mystery? Let's take the, the Fed's economists, economists who actually work for the Fed. Apparently, there's about 300 of them, many in the Eccles building, many of them with Ivy League degrees and presumably quite intelligent. What, what do they learn or not learn as they obtain their PhDs in econ? What, how do they view money and monetary policy? Why are they so seemingly clueless to the facts of life as we see them? They don't understand the interest rate. They don't understand the fact that the interest rate is not a tool of government, that the interest rate is an expression of how people value future versus present goods and money. And that the interest rate pervades the market economy, is determined by the market economy. And when it's distorted, it causes misallocations. Just as if the government had raised the price of, let's say, um, apples, suddenly everyone would be investing in, 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 in producing more apple groves and, and apples and so on. And we would have uh, malinvestment in that respect. And, and a lot of that capital that could have been used to produce more cars and medicines would be destroyed. Well, that's what's happening here. That's one thing they learn. The other thing they learn is that interest rates are not an expression of how people feel about the present and future in, in their savings, but interest rates are a barrier to investment. So if you push interest rates very low, everybody's going to borrow and invest, regardless of what profit prospects they see in the future, regardless of the fact that they, uh, the employers might worry about uh, the, the expense of Obamacare, for example, or getting into another war. So there are many factors that, that um, affect uh, investment. It's not just manipulating the interest rate. This is what Keynes taught the you know, wrongly taught the economists now who are getting their PhDs, okay, that's, that's still in the textbooks, that the interest rate is something to be manipulated. But it seems like there's almost a mania for borrowing and consumption over capital accumulation and saving. Well, how did this occur? I mean, this seems like a profound shift in our thinking. Yeah, I think it began to occur in the 1990s. I think when interest rates pushed down in the 1990s and then again in the 2000s, as I said, people saw this, the value of their stocks going up, the value of their, their houses going up, and they said to themselves, we don't have to save as much for our children's tuition, for our own retirement, or for any other comforts that we may want in the future because of the in falsely increasing value of our assets. So we can go out and spend most of the income that we're earning now and just allow our assets to appreciate. And so that really got us into this consumption binge, which went on to the, through the 2000s. And you know what? The next generation has picked that up. So the millennials, you know, that's now becoming ingrained. If you look at any American's closet, their, their closet are stuffed with clothing. I mean, it was a, there was a retail tail boom that was amazing, you know, in, in, in the 2000s. And those are all capital goods. But when we talk about the 1990s, it almost seems like that might as well be the 1890s. Is, yeah. is it true? Is it possible for a young person today to obtain a PhD in economics, knowing little or nothing about the history of economic thought? In other words, it's like we're just dropping them onto an island today. What they're learning in economics has nothing to do with the real world. I've just been reading uh, two new books on macro just to, to catch up on what modern macro is, uh, you know, and what, what they're telling students. And basically, these new books, which haven't gotten to the students' textbooks, fortunately, say that the models that are made up in macro to explain the economy really have nothing to do with the economy. And you can make all of these ridiculously false assumptions. I mean, even, even to, to more extreme than Milton Friedman's whole idea that not every assumption happens to be realistic. So what they're doing is that they're making up models that have uh, an island with coconuts, and it has two or three people that are trying to trade on it. And, and they're, they're coming up with conclusions about the real economy, about what we should do with interest rates and, and how we should conduct monetary policy out of these simplistic, unrealistic models. It, it, it all shows off your mathematical proficiency. So they, they learn nothing about the real world, is the bottom line. 
Would you say that mainstream economics today is broken? Are, are things that bad? Should we be that worried about what goes on in, in academia, but also in, amongst professional economists? Yeah, it's completely broken. I mean, there is a, a, a soul searching going on in, in economics right now. And there are a number of books that have come out. I mean, they're certainly not by Austrians, but uh, one book I'm reading is questioning the whole idea of, of just having this, this view of the economy that you can really play a game, set up a, a game, and without any theory, you can come up with sort of results that mimic the results of a real economy. So whether or not it's realistic, if it mimics the, you know, what happens to consumption, what happens to investment and output, well then, well, that's a good model. So economics has lost its the theory. The great thing about Austrian economics is that it starts with a theory. It starts with the human being at the center and a human being striving to, to satisfy his or her wants and then builds up a whole theory of the economy, including business cycles and the interest rate and so on. That is not done today. People just look at these macro data, you know, uh, they look at, you know, what income is doing and so on. And then they try to come up with these mathematical models that mimic that. So, yes, macroeconomics in particular, it's completely broken. They know it and there is some soul searching, but they'll never get back to, um, to sane economics. So, you know, uh, really, Austrian economics is going to have to displace the mainstream. OK, we can't teach them. We have to teach the students coming through. Well, it's a very scary thought. Uh, if, if economics is broken, then we wonder about our actual economy itself. Joe Salerno, thanks so much for joining us. And ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend.